Now, uh, with no further ado, I would like to introduce our first and keynote speaker. Now, you know, in many conferences, the, key pers the, the chairperson says, the next speaker needs no introduction. Now, and I want, who the fuck is this uh, speaker? I never heard of him. Is this recorded? Okay, so, any but anyway, today's keynote speaker really does not need any introduction. It is uh, Professor Galia Ra from Sheba Medical Center. Uh, very, not only an excellent physician, and can I tell them that you are my sister-in-law? Uh, but, but also uh, very well known in the media. So Galia will give us now the keynote lecture, which is briefly called COVID-19, past, present, and future. So Galia, please, if you will, how do we switch to the slideshow? Okay, so for all the speakers, th there is one microphone here, another one here for the questions. There is a laser pointer. You can hardly see the laser on this big screen, but it does switch the slides. Kalia, thank you for thank you, being here. Thank you, Okay, thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, to speak about COVID, wow. <laughs> So now, you know, two years and three months with COVID-19, with endless papers on the disease and even more on the vaccines, I think that we have more questions than answers. Sorry. During the pandemic, I found myself not only as infectious, infectious disease physician that has to decide on diagnosis, how to diagnose, how to treat, to implement infection control measures, uh, to, to, to perform studies, research, but also to, to participate about 20 hours a week in national committees. And I think that after such horrible period, I really need what I call COVID rehab prog program. If you have any ideas, please let me know how to do it. And instead of being with rehabilitation, I'm standing here and trying, you know, to summarize this really unusual period. Okay. Okay. So I'm sure that infectious disease is the most exciting field in medicine, really. And look at this map. You see how many emerging and re-emerging diseases we have during the last uh, years. It died for you, for your center. You know, whenever students ask me, what is my nightmare? So usually I say a respiratory born disease, uh, virus that usually jump from animal to host, a new virus that we have not experienced before and we don't have any immunity against it, highly transmissible, cause asymptomatic infection for sure, and with great capability for morbidity and mortality, and that's exactly SARS-CoV-2. So this is my nightmare. Now, in September 2019, exactly three months before the first case of COVID-19, Dr. Tedros, the WHO director, urged that we are not ready for the next epidemic. And on the last day of 2019, Wuhan Municipal Health Commission reported to the WHO on cluster of pneumonia cases. And it took a whole month to the WHO to declare that we are in the middle of public health emergency of international concern, not pandemic yet. And the world leader really didn't took seriously the virus. 
Giuseppe Conti from uh, Italy say everything is totally under control. You remember Italy. Hassan Rouhani said conspiracy of our enemies to shut down the country. Boris Johnson, we should be going about our business as usual. Bolsonaro from Brazil, a lot of that is fantasy when it comes to the coronavirus. However, more people died from COVID-19 in the US than from any war in the, in the, in the world or even from any uh, pandemic, any flu pandemic, even the Spanish uh, uh, flu and it's before the Omicron. The economy shut down the cost to humanity was unbelievable, and no country was immune against the disaster. And we faced a, a pandemic with shortage of masks. You remember these pictures, how to make a face mask? And in spite of the H1N1, the SARS, the MERS, live market animals are still very popular in China and in other countries. You know, giving the opportunity to animal viruses to mutate, to mix, and to jump to humans. And whenever we have pandemic, read it, I, I, I really wrote it that you'll remember it. Whenever we have a pandemic, we look back and wish we had invested more. Our memory fades. And the other priorities are getting the resources. It was before the pandemic, and I think also we have it quite now. Currently, we have more than 484 million cases in the world, more than 6.1 million deaths, and it's for sure underestimation. In Israel, almost 4 million cases, and 10,500 deaths. And look here, just I'll try to, to show it, yeah. Uh, there is really COVID has really unusual presentation of successive waves, you know, multiple successive waves. And look here at the really, the, the waves and the slopes demonstrating the unique evolution of infectious disease. And let's see, the first wave in spring 20, you know, very small wave, increasing the number of cases and then decrease. But the decrease of the number of cases was not to the baseline. You know, it's not like flu that between seasons, we don't have any cases. Here, all the time we have cases, also between waves. So the first wave, with its slope, the second wave in summer 20 with the slope, again, decreasing of number, but not to the baseline. And now the sharp slope of the fall winter 2021, the third wave, again, decreasing of cases, again, increase, but all the time the decrease is not to the baseline. So SARS-CoV-2, as you probably know, it's better coronavirus, single-stranded, enveloped RNA virus with relatively large genome, with four structural proteins, the, the a spike protein, the envelope, the matrix, and the nucleoprotein, and the S, the spike protein is responsible with its RBD uh, to bind to the ACE2 receptor, which found on multiple tissues, mainly in the upper airway uh, through which the, uh, the virus entered the body, lungs, cardiovascular system, gastrointestinal system, and all over. Now, this is the phylogenetic tree of the coronaviruses. And you see here in red, the human coronaviruses. Here, these three ones are the pandemic coronaviruses the SARS-1, the MERS, and the SARS-2. And highlight in a yellow are the corona, coronaviruses that are known for many years that cause usually common cold. And altogether, these four uh, coronaviruses are responsible for about 15 to 30% of common colds usually in winter. However, as you can see here, there are thousands of potential coronaviruses in bats that can cause corona in the future. 
So in 2002, we had the SARS. 10 years later, the MERS. 10 years later, the COVID-19. And I hope that we won't have such pandemic every uh, 10 years. So the SARS included 8,000 cases with 10% mortality rate. It started in uh, bat viruses, jumped to the intermediate host, the civet cats, and from the civet cats to human beings. Now there was total control of the outbreak because with SARS, we don't have asymptomatic carrier, and that's very important. The first case of, uh, of MERS was in uh, 2012, and it was in a man with pneumonia in Saudi Arabia. And uh, as you can see, not a lot of cases, however, with very high mortality rate, 36%, also started in bats, the intermediate host camels, and human beings. Now, what is the source of COVID-19? It's still a mystery. You know, one theory, it's the wet market of Wuhan with its tasty food. Or lab leak, no answer. I don't know. If you know, I like to <laughs> hear it. Now, what about the transmission? The main transmission of COVID-19 is through respiratory droplets, which are relatively large and spread to less than two meters. And this is a, a, the reason to two distance, uh, to two meters of social distancing because of the respiratory droplet route of uh, transmission. Now, in the beginning of the pandemic, there was a lot of debate whether COVID-19 is transmitted uh, via airborne uh, route, like tuberculosis, like measles. Now we know for sure, yes, it can be transmitted through airborne route which means very tiny, uh, 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 what we call nuclear droplets that are less than five micron and they spread for longer distance, four meter and even more. However, in the beginning of, disease, of the pandemic, you remember that we were very afraid of contaminated surfaces. Now we know that transmission through contaminated, contaminated surfaces doesn't exist at all. And the uh, risk is greatest in enclosed spaces with poor ventilation, with behaviors such as singing, exercise, etc. Now, in the beginning of the pandemic, we didn't appreciate it that one third of patients have asymptomatic disease. And furthermore, we didn't appreciate it that 60% of all cases result from asymptomatic transmission, 35% from presymptomatic individuals, and 24% from individuals who never develop symptoms. And this find, finding was very important, and it really transformed the approach, the approach to the infection and the importance of wearing masks. You remember that, you know, in the beginning of the pandemic, the Ministry of Health told us that it's not so important to be with masks, and it was really changed uh, uh, at all. Now, the clinical features of COVID-19 is very similar to uh, influenza, only with one unique symptom of loss of taste and smell that can, you know, usually it precedes respiratory symptoms. It can continue for months. And uh, several, uh, several weeks ago, there was a very nice study in Nature that showed that there is brain region that are really related to smell that show in, a, in imaging decline even following the mild COVID-19. With the Omicron, the presentation, the clinical presentation is a little bit different. There is much less loss of taste and smell, much less. And one of the most common uh, uh, symptoms is scratchy, scratchy throat. Really, people describe it as if they have knife in their throat. And with the BA2 variant, we have much more GI symptoms. Nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain, bloating, and diarrhea. So yeah, it's different. Now, from the beginning of the of the COVID nineteen, it's uh, um, 
studies from China that shows that mild to moderate disease, 80% of patients, 14% of, uh, of patients have a severe disease, and only 5% have critical disease, which needs a, a ICU, mechanical ventilation, etc. The case fatality rate overall is 2.3%. With Omicron, it's 0.6%. However, the mortality rate among those who need ICU, who needs ventilation, according to, the, you know, to this literature, it's about 20%. However, I don't agree. What we see is you know, who comes to the ICU ventilated, the mortality rate approaches 50 to 70%, and that's what we see. The manifestation of a severe COVID-19 is mainly acute respiratory distress syndrome, ARDS. We see cardiac dysfunction with myocarditis, which is much more common than following the vaccine. Neurological disorders with Guillain-Barre, encephalitis, acute kidney injury, I've never seen a disease, and really we see it when we, try, when we started to treat a patient, a disease like COVID, that in the beginning of the disease, we have influenza-like illness, and after 10 to 14 days, we have something totally different. The virus activates the inflammatory system, causing hyperinflammation, or what we call cytokine release syndrome, Activation of the coagulation system, nobody really knew it. And a lot of thrombi all over the body. And in kids, we have the MISC, the multi-system inflammatory syndrome. And who develop, who are at increased risk for severe COVID? Older patients, older people, people with underlying disease like obesity, diabetes, hypertension, COPD, pregnancy, and more. And during the last two waves, we have learned that unvaccinated people are at, at the highest risk for severe COVID-19. There are two post-COVID conditions. One is residual organ damage. For example, patients who had severe COVID pneumonia, especially with those who were in the ICU, have really a lot of lung damage. Sometimes they need respiratory rehabilitation. Some of them need a lung transplant. Now we have experience with transplant uh, with several patients. I have now uh, one patient uh, that now I succeeded to bring him to Sheba. He was in other hospitals eight months on ECMO, and now he came to our hospital to undergo lung transplant. 46-year physician without any underlying disease only he was unvaccinated. Physician, yeah. And 10 to 30% of patients with COVID develop signs and symptoms that are not completely explainable by any pathogenic uh, process. And we called it long COVID. And long COVID, uh, usually they have extreme fatigue, unexplained shortness of breath, uh, myalgia, muscle pain, dysautonomia, they have temperature dysregulation, unexplained tachycardia. During the last months, I have seen several patients with unexplained dysphagia. They are not able to swallow. Sleep disturbances, depression and anxiety, and the most common complaint is brain fog. And it really reminds me on chronic fatigue syndrome that I have many patients with this disease, and now also COVID causes it. Okay, during now we'll go, we'll move to treatment. Uh, and it really was fascinating because, you know, I, on March, I think it was 10th of March, something like this, I have to treat the first patient in Israel. You know, we had several patients from the Princess Diamond, but they, they were positive, PCR positive, but they were completely healthy. And this first patient, I think he was patient number four or five, and he was very famous in Israel. If you remember, he was the head of the Pirata Adon. And everybody blamed that he brought his, he, 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 with him the corona came to Israel from Italy. 
And, you know, it's the first time that we did CT scan uh, for patients with corona, and we were, we were very excited to see the changes in the CT scan. And he was in, and I have to decide how to treat him. And what I know, I don't know. Do I know how to treat uh, corona? And really, making clinical decision in the absence of evidence was not really not easy at all. So what I do? Uh, okay, looking at SARS-CoV-1 and MERS, however, there was no treatment. In vitro data, ah, the Chinese really um, published their national guidelines. They felt so guilty about the, the COVID-19, so they want every, the old world to know how to treat the patients. But we didn't uh, believe so much uh, what was written there. And surprisingly, the social network really was the most informative. And I used the WhatsApp, the WeChat with the Chinese. The Twitter, you know, before the, key, the COVID, I had no idea what Twitter is. And Twitter became my best friend. A lot of very important data. And the crown is given to the Med Archive. Uh, sometimes a lot of garbage, but sometimes a lot of informative very important and informative very important information is published ahead of a time so really i give my the crown to the med archive okay everybody remember this president with the game changer hydroxychloroquine that was found very active very, very effective <laughs> now the solidarity trial you know, the WHO launches the Solidarity Study, which was a global uh, mega trial on the four most promising corona uh, treatments that were in your country. And I really refused to participate in this study. Why? Remdesivir was one option. However, in this time, we didn't have remdesivir in Israel, you know, to use. Chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine I didn't want to give it because I felt that it's not, it's awful to say felt, yeah, on uh, <laughs> science, but I really didn't see the logic to administer hydroxychloroquine to corona, uh, to corona patient. And uh, a lot of side effects, you know, it was a lot of heart rhythm problems, so I didn't want to, to give it. Ritonavir, lopinavir, many physicians gave it. You know, I have a lot of experience with this drug called Caletra because it was one of the uh, treatment for HIV patients. However, with my experience, I knew that about 20% of patients develop severe diarrhea, and I was afraid that there was enhanced transmission of the corona uh, with the diarrhea. And furthermore, you know, lopinavir is protease inhibitor. However, the protease of HIV is totally different from the protease of SARS-CoV-2. So what is the logic to administer it? So I really refuse it, and Israel didn't participate in the solidarity trial. And finally, really, all these drugs were found not effective in the solidarity trial. Okay, so in the beginning of the pandemic, we really treated only patients who were hospitalized. And the most logic approach was, you know, to kill the virus. And if we'll kill the virus, we'll prevent, you know, the activation of the inflammation, uh, activation of the coagulation system. So we wanted, you know, to target the virus. And you see here the potential sites for the antivirals. And really, the first antiviral that was approved was the remdesivir. And you know, a lot of studies, some showing that it's active, some showing it's not active. And it's really very difficult to decide, is it effective or not effective? And good studies, you know, not like in the beginning of the, of the pandemic. I really think that remdesivir really helps not, not a game changer, but really helps patients who needs low oxygen flow. And we use it, we use it a lot. And I, remdesivir, uh, as you see here, is an RNA polymerase in, 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 inhibitor. And also we use all, a, a lot covalescent plasma. Uh, and covalescent plasma, as you can see here, really prevent the virus to bind to the ACE receptor. 
So that's was our first treatment, remdesivir and covalescent plasma, the antivirals. Then the other approach is to moderate the host response. And how we do it? We do it with dexamethasone, and dexamethasone really helps. Uh, a lot of all studies show it's really effective. However, physician wants to treat patients, and they treat all of them. And it was really awful because many patients who didn't need uh, uh, dexamethasone got it. And dexamethasone is steroids with a lot of side effects. So really, it's helpful only for patients who need oxygen, oxygen and more, yeah? But not patients who don't need uh, oxygen. Monoclonal antibodies against the anti interleukin 6, the tocilizumab, JAK inhibitor, the baricitinib, um, found to be effective. However, also, there are studies that show it's effective, studies that show it's ineffective. And it's very difficult to decide whether really it's effective or not. And a lot of other clinical studies with immunomodulators and anticoagulation because of the activation of the coagulation system, as I showed you before. Now, I must admit that COVID treatment in hospitalized patients, especially those uh, in ICU, is very, very, and even very disappointing. And it's so frustrating, you know, to face the family that comes with miracle drugs that they show uh, or the red in the Idiot Achronot Israel Ayom and want me to, to, to give the patients a lot. Every month, a new, new miracle. However, really disappointing. Now, the science breakthrough of the year 2020 is undoubtedly the COVID-19 vaccines. And now, there are 119 clinical studies on vaccine, COVID vaccines. These are the 10 leading COVID-19 uh, vaccines. And you can see here uh, the name of the developer, and this is the, the uh, commercial name. And we know that we have four uh, platforms, two mRNA platforms, the Pfizer and the Moderna, three viral vector vaccines with the adenovirus, the AstraZeneca, the Johnson & Johnson, and the Sputnik. A two protein vaccines with the Novavax, and two inactivated vaccines, the Sinopharm and the uh, Sinovac. The two last vaccines are not approved by the WHO. And if you'll take Pfizer vaccine, for example, it's approved in the US. However, in other countries, there is EUA, what we call emergency use authorization. These are the two classical efficacy trials that were published in December two, two, uh, 2020. And they found 25 efficacy for the uh, Pfizer vaccine and 24.1% efficacy for Moderna vaccine. And it was very surprising. I must tell you that usually we are used to about 50% efficacy in elderly or in, uh, you know, in, in adults. If you'll take the influenza vaccine, you'll take the Zostavax, uh, even Endurix against hepatitis B are not so effective. It's the first time, really, almost first time, that we see with messenger RNA vaccine such high efficacy in elderly. Usually we have immunosenescence and we don't see such good uh, results. Uh, the efficacy of the uh, viral vector vaccine, you see here the AstraZeneca 70.4 vaccine, and Johnson and Johnson, Johnson, 66 efficacy overall, 72 in United States, less in South Africa because of the probably the beta variant, and 85% efficacy against severe disease. Now, efficacy study that uh, I, I show now are usually done in randomized control, uh, double blind, multi center studies. And effectiveness in real world setting usually are done by observational studies. And usually, usually the results of efficacy studies are better than effectiveness. And this study that was published by the Ministry of Health 
really did observa observational study on the effectiveness of the Pfizer vaccine. And it was possible because really in Israel, we did, we are the first country, really mass vaccination uh, with the Pfizer uh, uh, vaccine. And you can see that the results of the effectiveness was similar to the efficacy studies. 95% efficacy uh, against the infection, 97% efficacy against symptomatic disease, COVID-related hospitalization, severe or critical related hospitalization, and even COVID-19 related deaths. And uh, it was found in all age groups. However, it's important to say that the study was done uh, during the alpha, uh, the alpha variant and not the Delta. So afterwards, there was a study by the CDC that shows that after Delta became the most common variant, fully vaccinated people had reduced risk of infection by fivefold, reduced risk of hospitalization by tenfold, and reduced risk of death by tenfold. So the summary was that vaccination offers strong protection against COVID-19. Now I want to analyze the epidemiology of COVID-19 in Israel. And let's start, okay. Now, sorry, we have here only four, uh, uh, four waves because you know, the Omicron wave, we need another scale. So we'll change the scale in between. So the first wave, you see very small wave with lockdown of four weeks. Then the second, the second wave, a little bit bigger, a larger, with a second lockdown of about five weeks. So why lockdowns, you know? Not so many cases. So I'll remind you that the, really the aim of the lockdown was to prevent sudden increase in the number of hospitalization beyond the healthcare for capacity exactly was what was in it, in Italy in the first and the second waves. And we call this the containment. Now, there are problems I like you really to present the main, I think, the main problems of the Israeli health system. One of the problems. <laughs> so it's really the number of beds a hospitalization bed per 1,000 population. And you see that in Japan, 7.8, South Korea, 7.1, Germany, 6, Italy, 2.6, US, 2.4, Israel, 2.2. And that's a problem. And furthermore, 10% of hospital beds should be ICU beds. In Israel, less than 5%. So we really have a shortage of, IC, of beds all over and mainly ICU beds. So the shortage of ICU capacity forced really Israel to focus on an early aggressive containment strategy. And this was the lockdowns. And I think it was okay to do these lockdowns. Okay, following the second wave, a lot of celebration all over, everything is open. Uh, airport, restaurants, schools, university, and together with the alpha variant, which is twice more transmissible than the wild type or the Wuhan variant, really caused the third huge uh, uh, wave. Okay, December 19, vaccination uh, began in Israel. Several days later, the third lockdown. And really, there was very successful vaccine rollout in Israel. So between April and uh, July, 62% of the uh, population was vaccinated. And there were only 20 new cases a day, 20. And most of them came from abroad, not from Israel. So it was great and everything said, OK, bye bye Corona. But here comes the fourth wave a huge, huge false wave. And what was the reason for the false wave? So three theories, and it's not theories, I think all together. So first of all, everybody said the Delta variant, yes, spread all over the, the, the world. 
uh, very transmissible, more than the alpha. The viral loads among patients with Delta variants was 1,000 greater than those with the alpha variant. However, when we check it in vitro, the vaccine is active against the Delta. So it's not, uh, it's not the Delta. So now look at those age 60 or, or more. You see, and here you see the infection rate per uh, 1,000. And you see that those patients above uh, 60 years or more that were vaccinated in January, they have very high infection rate. Those who were vaccinated in April or May really have low number of, uh, of infections. And you see it in all age group. So the conclusion was, was that there is a strong effect of waning immunity in all age groups after six uh, months. And you know, the third thing is uh, I don't have to speak. You see it in the picture, forgetting infection control measure, everybody together, no mask, and all the three things I think together really cause the four, uh, fourth uh, wave, it is, it is, yeah, the, the, uh, the wave. And uh, on July 30, Israel decided to begin the third vaccination campaign on elderly and in immune compromised patients. And this was the third boost or the third or the first booster or the third vaccine. So it started as you see here in July, about two weeks later, people uh, 50 years or more were vaccinated with the third vaccine. And uh, a week later, those 40 years or more and the R, the reproduction number, decreased for 1.4 to less, uh, less than one. And the findings were really very nice. And uh, the Ministry of Health also published that confirmed infection were lower in the booster group by a factor of 11.3, and the rate of severe disease was lowered by a factor of almost 20. And I think this number is really very important to see the numbers or the rate of severe COVID-19 uh, by vaccination status among patients 60 years or more, and the rate is per 100,000 population. And you see that in unvaccinated, the rate was 174. The rate among those who got two vaccines, 33.7. And among those who got two vaccines and the booster, only 3.4. And the reactogenicity of the third, was, the third dose was even less than after the second dose or the first dose. And last week, a new uh, study was published in the, new, in, in, in the New England, and it's not effectiveness studies like in Israel, but efficacy study that show that the cell dose is very, is highly uh, effective, efficacy of 95.3%. The WHO had a lot or has a lot of criticism on the third booster. And they said, come on, look, at a, a 50 to 60% of population in Asia, Europe, America are really vaccinated. However, in Africa, less than 7% are vaccinated. So before giving the cell dose to these uh, continents, uh, go to Africa and really give the, the, the first and second vaccine. Okay. So let's go back to Israel and really following the booster, the third vaccine, the numbers really fell down and really impressive. Okay, another scale. So see the scale, first, second, third, fourth, and fifth wave with the Omicron with so many cases. And yeah, the Omicron really, the, the cause is really the, the 50 mutation that the Omicron variant has, 30, 30 mutation in the spike protein, 12 mutation in the receptor binding domain. And you see here the sharp increase in the number of cases. Yeah, Omicron is much more transmissible. And this is a ni nice work from Denmark that showed that higher household transmiss transmissibility of Omicron compared to Delta among patients who were uh, vaccinated, people who were vaccinated. 
However, the Omicron cause less severe disease. We see here a, a study from South Africa that only 5% of people were needed admission to the hospital compared to 14% and 19% of those with Delta and Beta variants. Less need for a, a needing a oxygen. A severe disease only 29% uh, compared to 67 and 60%. A, only 6% died compared to 24% among those with a, a Delta or, or Beta. And Omicron has a, also immune evasion. You see here a, the me messenger RNA vaccine effectiveness, which is lower against here in gray, a, the Omicron compared to here in black, the Delta. And it's true for after following two doses, following a, a Pfizer booster and following a Moderna booster. And furthermore, there is threefold greater reinfection re risk with the Omicron. And this work, work we have done, we check the neutralization of elderly patients who got the booster vaccine. Uh, this work was done uh, with uh, uh, Michal Mandelbaum. And uh, we found that uh, really the neutralization against the Omicron was much lower than comparing to the Delta or the wild type or the ones a, a variant. And there's good uh, neutralizing antibody following a, a three, three weeks or a month, but after three months or six months, really the neutralization is very low. And with all this, all this data, the CDC expand COVID-19 booster recommendation for everybody over 18 years. And here we come to the first vaccine, to the first dose or the second booster. And we are in the Tzatam, Tzavet Lemeniat Magifot. We decided really to recommend the first uh, dose for elderly and those who are at risk, or mainly immune-compromised patients, who, who are really at risk for severe disease. And this work from Kupat Cholim Klalit, that uh, now is in review in Nature, it's a work that was done on more than half a million cases. And they found that deaths due to COVID-19 occurred in only 92 second booster recipients and in 232 participants who received only three vaccine or one booster. And I think it's very important, this work, that really show that the first vaccine really protect against hospitalization and deaths. The work from Sheba that was done by Gili Regev, you know, healthcare worker, they don't usually, you know, uh, more, more, uh, more healthy. Nobody was hospitalized uh, with COVID-19. Uh, nobody died. And she checked really the infection rate and the infection rate among those who got the Pfizer vaccine the first, I'm speaking about the first vaccine, the Pfizer, the Moderna, or who were given only three doses was the same. So the infection rate it was not changed, was not affected by the uh, first vaccine. And yesterday, uh, the FDA authorized second booster dose uh, of the COVID vaccine only to older and immune compromised individuals. Okay, I told you that in the beginning of the disease, only inpatients were treated. And nowadays, the treatment was shifted to the, to the outpatients. And we have several ways to, to protect, to, to, to really to, to treat the, the people. PrEP, what we call pre-exposure prophylaxis, to give it to patients who don't have any illness, uh, only to prevent. And here the options are vaccines that I have talked already and monoclonal antibodies. And the monoclonal, the only monoclonal antibodies that was authorized already is the AstraZeneca or what we call the Evoshield. And I'm speaking about people who are at risk and are quite healthy now, don't have any exposure or any disease. 
And the province study showed 77% reduction in the incidence of symptomatic COVID-19 among those who were treated with the Evoshield, uh, eight patients compared to 17 patients, those who got the placebo. It was success. However, this work was not done on Omicron. And there is in vitro data that shows that there is decreased neutralization of the uh, Omicron compared to the previous variants. However, the IDSA, the Infectious Disease Society of America, and the Ministry of Health recommend to administer the Evoshield to moderately or severely immune compromised patients. Uh, however, it's really conditional recommendation with low certainty of evidence. Uh, but nowadays, you know, it's, it's, it's in Israel. Okay, so this one option of treatment, you know, we don't have any data, you know, from really treatment of patients uh, with the Omicron on Evoshield. We have only this province study uh, on the Delta and Alpha variants. Post-exposure prophylaxis. Uh, yes, it's, it's possible, you know, to give household um, you know, if you have a spouse, uh, children that are sick, you can, uh, you can get the monoclonal antibodies, the Regeneron and the Bamlanivumab of Eli Lilly. However, these monoclonal antibodies that were found effective in post-exposure prophylaxis are not effective at all to the Omicron. So nowadays we don't have a post-exposure prophylaxis. And the last approach is therapy. And therapy, outpatient therapy, usually we treat patients who are at risk for deterioration, you know, who has underlying disease, patient with mild to moderate COVID, and patient that have symptoms not more than five days. And what we have here, okay, so we have the monoclonal antibodies. Uh, BAMLA and the, and the Regeneron are not effective anymore, I told you. So trovimab is a possibility. So trovimab is a monoclonal antibody uh, of uh, uh, GSK. Uh, however, it was not, we don't have it in Israel. And now we know that the BA2 variant is not effective. It's not effective against the BA2. Uh, so nowadays we don't have so much uh, monoclonal antibody and we'll shift to the, nowadays Eli Lilly, oh, it's not in this slide. Uh, Eli Lilly or the FDA approved another, a new uh, monoclonal antibodies. This is effective for all the variants that we have nowadays, but we don't have it yet. And let's move to the oral uh, antiviral. Uh, the Paxlovid, the Nirmatrelavir and Ritonavir, a very promising drug that found, you know, the study that was published already in New England. Uh, found 90% reduction in hospitalization or deaths compared to placebo, 10 deaths in the placebo arm and no deaths in the treatment arm. The problem with the Paxlovid is that it has so many drug-drug interactions that it's very difficult to administer it. And our, uh, you know, the most people, the people who need it more are not able to take it because taking anticoagulants, taking, you know, acting cancer, et cetera. And the other drug is monopiravir. It's polymerase inhibitor, RNA polymerase inhibitor. However, MSD found that it was only 30%, not 90% like the Paxlovid, 30% decrease in hospitalization and death uh, in the treatment arm, nine deaths, uh, nine, nine deaths in the placebo, and one death in the treatment arm. Uh, one of the problem with the uh, monopiravir that in vitro it causes mutagenicity. And it, it, it probably, there is no clinical uh, importance. However, it's uh, forbidden for pregnant women and children. And both drugs, the monopiravir and the Paxlovir are given orally for five days. And with the monopiravir, there is no drug-drug in interaction. So it's easy to administer. So now you'll ask me what is going to happen. And I'll tell you that I don't have a crystal ball. Don't know, it's not my hands. There are good news and bad news. The good news is that we have effective vaccines. The bad news is that the vaccines are active for a limited, limited period of time, and that a large segment of the population do not want to get vaccinated. Now, there are different phases of pandemic. 
The first phase is the pandemic phase where there is explosion of cases. I think that we are over it. Then there is the acceleration of cases. And there are three possibilities. One is to eradicate the, the, the disease. I'm sure we are not able to eradicate uh, corona. The only infectious disease that was eradicated is smallpox. It's possible to eliminate the disease. I'm sure that we are not able to eliminate COVID. The only disease, no, there are several disease, the infectious disease that were eliminated, measles, polio. And the only option is control. And now the question is, at what level of control are we going to be, a, be, a, to be able to get back to some degree or to degree of normality? I don't think that with 15,000 cases a day, we can call it control yet. Sorry. <laughs> and the last uh, slide. So what shall we do? To do better with vaccines, to implement other mitigation methods, and to vaccinate the rest of the world, particularly low and middle income countries. And until we'll have a truly global response to this pandemic, we will not be able to control it. And thank you. <laughs>